Dear students, we are now at almost the last phase of the course. We still have to uh, walk our way through a number of letters which are, gen which are most of the time called the general epistles or the, uh, the Catholic epistles. Catholic means overall, overarching. A number of these, seven in all, and we have to go through them all. So it's, it's I mean, it, we are pressed in time. And there's so much we can talk about. And really, it's almost impossible to do so. But let's go fast, quick through it. The first book we are talking about is the book of James. Before we can start anything to say about it, is we have to look for who that Mr. James is. He's an apostle, but who is he? Because there are two people in the uh, apostolic group with the name James. And so uh, there is the, uh, uh, the son of Zebedee, which, which is called... Uh, James the Greater, and then we have James the Lesser, or James the, the Just. And James the Just seemingly is uh, a half-brother of Jesus. And when I say half-brother of Jesus, we have to be uh, careful to explain that. What we can learn from the whole situation is the following. We have James... A brother of Jesus, that's how he's called, but seemingly is a half-brother, not just because the, uh, the Holy Spirit is the real father of Jesus. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, is of course his mother. But Joseph was the person uh, who lived with Mary uh, before and after Jesus was born. And then suddenly... We don't know what happened, seemingly nobody knows because it's not mentioned anywhere. Uh, Joseph disappears. Later on we find James being the brother of Jesus, but he is the son, not of, of Zebedee, because that's the other James, but he's the son of Alpheus. So who is this? Well, uh, I will give you a, a possibility here. I think... Alpheus is the second husband of Mary. When Joseph died, she remarried and Alpheus took over and he, uh, they got a number of children and one of them was James. When you take that in, into consideration, all the other things that are being questioned are falling in place and they fi you find a, a, a very reasonable explanation because one thing uh, so-called uh, intelligent researchers are doing is actually tearing apart the reality and the reality is that a textbook example of what we have is that all of the writers of the New Testament are a apostle or a direct co-worker of an apostle. In this case, we have the author. And the author is uh, what we, we call him uh, James. But uh, let, let, me, let me tell you what is happening here. Because James is actually uh, the, the Anglicanized or the Anglicanized the English form of Jacob. So he's, the person himself is named after the great uh, forefather of the Jewish nation, Jacob. And in other languages, you have exactly the same word, the same name being used for Jacob and here. Of course, since this is Greek and, and Jacob is a, uh, a Hebrew name, so there is a, 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 a Greek addition to it and we call it Jacobus but okay 
So now we have uh, what we what what I wanted to, to say to you. That was that the man James. We know of one of the Jameses. That is the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. John, the son of Zebedee, died in the year forty-four. If he would have been the writer of the book of James, that would say that the that the text was written before forty-four. The other thing is, if it is not. James, son of Zebedee, but John, uh, James, the son of uh, Alpheus, then we have another problem. Because uh, according to, again, tradition, and you know tradition, that is something I don't really like, but tradition is there, uh, and tradition says that, it's actually Josephus, who says that James died in the year 62. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that Luke who was supposed to be in that area when he wrote uh, his book called The Acts of the Apostles. He doesn't mention anything about the death of the second James. He speaks about the first James who died. He speaks about uh, Stephanus, Stephen, but nothing about the second, uh, the second killing or the killing of the second James. So, it means that the book of Acts was written before 62. You see, everything, I, I, what I try to explain to you is that everything is linked to each other. Dates and names and places and things that happen were all inter, uh, interrelated. They are intertwined to each other. So here we have James. Uh, James the Lesser, or James the Just, or James the Younger, or or, or, or whatever. You know, we, we have we have a person, and uh, uh, when it's James the Lesser, he died in sixty two. So the text of the of the book of James is of course earlier than sixty two, because otherwise, I mean. None of the two Jameses, the two Apostle Jameses, uh, were alive after that time. So what, what, what do we have? We have a clear understanding that one of those two is the writer. And let's go for the easy way and say it is James the Lesser. Because the, uh, there's always a possibility that it was James the Greater. Uh, he could have written it, and then the text is uh, uh, pre-44. But, no, it's not completely, uh, not completely clear what, uh, what we can think about it. So we know two possibilities. We know that the, 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 the writing of the book is early, in the sense that it's before, uh, before 62, anyway. Uh, whatever and whoever says something about it, that's the biblical reality according to the historian Josephus. Josephus is the one who is predicting the gain or the victory uh, of, a, of a, a general uh, and then he says you're going to be the emperor and everything that he said was actually happening to that man. So we know that he is kind of trustworthy. Uh, of course, not everything he says is what we call Holy Evangel or Holy Gospel. But what we have is we have a person here that is probably right in numbers. So let, let's, let's go with it. Um, the book of James is reacting to what is called anti Nomianalism, anti-nomianalism. It means those who said that the Old Testament, this Old Testament has nothing to do with us anymore and we don't have anything to do with the Old Testament because we have the New Testament, we live in the time of grace, so we don't have anything to do with the Old Testament. In itself, there is a truth insight 
But when you overemphasize that truth, then you start with something completely new, what is nothing to do with the reality. Like uh, uh, the, the Reformation says, uh, by grace alone. In the book of James, you find that grace is only sufficient when it's completed by works. So it's by grace alone, but grace only through, uh, through I mean, the, the showing of works. And that is that's the, the problem we face here is that in the past, even the great Martin Luther was kind of hesitant even to, to take this book on board. Uh, first of all, it was kind of a, this, a, a different sense, a different way of looking at things. And, and Luther didn't like it, and so he called it the, the book of straw. But it's not a book of straw. It is a biblical writing given to us with a clear explanation and of course I cannot go into the details because I want you to read the book completely through and then we and then you will find out for yourself by the guiding the leading uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit it speaks about the, uh, the justification with God it speaks about uh, the, the, the concentration of how you um, how you enable faith and work works to to function together. So it is not something that is on one hand you have faith, on the other hand you have works. We have both of them in this book. That's the beauty of the book. I think that's one of the most uh, adult. Uh, ideas that are being set in this book. There's a, a, a whole range of what we call key verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith develops perseverance. James 1, verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry and then uh, other key verses are chapter 2 the verses 17 and 18 chapter 3 the verses verse 5 chapter 5 verse 16 very well known the prayer of the righteous is a powerful is powerful and effective what one, one text is not being mentioned here and that's what i find a very important text and that is verse 20, 27 of the first chapter religion that our God that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world uh, so many people say oh there is a, so many Christian, even born again Christians, they mistakenly say there's a, a, a distinction, a difference between religion and a relationship. Let me say it this way. According to this text, it's very clear. If we don't have the right religion, we cannot have a relationship. So this is the text that proves it. Uh, a whole range of texts that are important uh, but when you go to uh, um, 1 verse 12 uh, and still I'm, I'm in the first chapter I'm sorry blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test uh, stood the test that person will receive the crown of life and of course you have to know that that is not the only text speaking about a crown of life. We have a whole range of crowns, actually five in all, that are promised to us as believers. And I will give you the text so you can write them down. It's 1 Corinthians 9, 25. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. 
2 Timothy 4 verse 8 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 and then we have I'm following the biblical order James 1 verse 12 and then we have 1 Peter 5 verse 4 we're going to touch on that again 1 Peter 5 verse 4 and then the last and we will talk about it tomorrow that's Revelations 2 verse 10 Revelations 2 verse 10 and when you look at it and when you read it and when you gather the, the material together then you see that God is actually giving us promising us a number of crowns and eventually and that's the greatest thing that we are going to do that is taking off our crown and giving it back to Jesus wow wow great great stuff that's what we are talking about the book of James outlines the fate uh, actually it, it outlines the fate walk how to walk in faith through a general religion you have to read the whole chapter the whole chapter one um, the genuine religion the genuine faith chapter two and three the genuine wisdom in chapter th three to five so we have beautiful things genuine religion general faith genuine wisdom so it um, it, it actually you can almost have parallels the, the story we find in Matthew 5 when Jesus sits down and has this wonderful sermon on the mount. So the relationship between faith and works is absolutely central to this book. You have to understand that when, when this was written, this was written most likely before the time of what we call the uh, apostolic council in jerusalem people didn't know uh, there's, there's, a, there's only a few uh, materials of the new testament being written before that and that is this book and the book of um, um, sorry the book of jude is also one there's a possibility there so you have james and uh, you have jude so the, 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 again and, and uh, paul writes also to the galatians and most probably also before that time so we have two or three books two or three letters being written before that and that is important to us because otherwise we may misunderstand what is going on so uh, the book of James given to us as part of the New Testament and ingrained in what we need to know okay, we talked about who was the author uh, let's move on because we all we only have uh, we, we still have uh, six other books the, the next book in your Bibles uh, behind the, the book of James is, is first Peter it's uh, and, and again I, I'm stressing this again we are talking about the Apostle Peter we are not talking about an impostor saying that he is Peter no we are talking about the Apostle Peter and the early church accepted the book only because they knew knew that Peter the Apostle wrote these materials both the first and the second book of Peter so we need to 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 grasp and stay with that, that, that strong foundation everything that is written in the New Testament is written on the authority of one of the Apostles remember how, how strange it would be if, uh, if, if, if someone else would write claiming to be a, a apostle or claiming to be someone in the apostolic band and then not being it do you, don't you think that people will know I mean we, we are not talking about 
some some stupid elements uh, somewhere uh, uh, living in the mountains, separated from the world for the rest from the rest uh, from the beginning of their life till the rest of their life. No, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, being led by the Holy Spirit, having uh, having gathered material that is called what we now call the New Testament. And in the beginning of the first century, at the end of the first century, we already have uh, books speaking, letters speaking about the other things, the other things that are being mentioned in what we now know, now know as the uh, New Testament. So it's it's all interlinked with each other, and it's all proven. So don't come up with uh, uh, foolish ideas. Uh, when you talk about Peter, of course. Uh, you must understand, we talked about it yesterday also, that Peter was, uh, uh, Peter died um, in, 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 well, let, let me say it this way. According to certain tradition, Peter died in Rome, uh, the latest, 68, because that was, that was when, when uh, the Emperor Nero died. And it is claimed that Peter died under uh, the Emperor Nero. Uh, th that is tradition, and that type of tradition is not is is not um, is not inspired. And when you don't have uh, when we have a type of tradition that is not inspired, we have to be extremely careful because we are we are speaking about. We're speaking about historical figures, but they speak about historical figures too. And when you make the link with history, you have to be very strong on this. So I assume, I assume, well, since Peter being an older man, and 68 is quite uh, uh, an age for a man of, of that, that type, he was a fisherman, so I had to work hard when he's young, and when you work hard when you're young, you, you, you tend to pay the price afterwards. So I, I assume he lived. Remember that in that in in, in general terms, in uh, in that time, we are talking about people averaging only thirty-five between thirty and thirty-five. So they died very young. Well, of course, he had a lot of wars and he had a lot of uh, sicknesses and there was no cure. Uh, uh, so, in generally spoken, when you get 68, you're kind of old. And that's what the Bible teaches us also. When you're 70, you're, well, excuse me, uh, when you're 70, you're old. When, you, when you're 80, you're very strong. Anyway, so that's what we have. I think Peter died in, his, in the 60s. We just take that on board, and that proves us. That gives us uh, uh, an incentive to say that the, the the letters were written in the 60s. Remember, we talked about the others also. James, maybe he wrote it in the 60s. Peter wrote in the 60s. What is the uh, the main idea in Peter? J just well, let, let's look at the uh, the uh, the key verses. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 1, uh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What a wonderful sentence. What a wonderful thing to say to us. That is what we have. So I, I, I do not assume here that uh, that it's wrong to say that Peter was really touched by what we call the resurrection. And every year we celebrate that resurrection. Funnily enough, we call that Easter because the, the biblical name is Passover, and I think Passover will be a better uh, a better word for it. So let's let's look at Passover around that time. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He died at the cross. He was put into a grave. He was laid in the grave. You know, 
uh, and we have uh, a big stone road in front of that grave and that grave uh, that, that that stone I don't know how they did that but uh, that stone was taken away it was rolled back or was you know anyway uh, it, by the way it's it's impossible the stone must have weighed up to uh, one and a half to two tons that is 1500 to 2000 kilos you do not move that so claiming that Jesus uh, was not really dead he was just seemingly dead and um, he was able to to take it from the inside to roll away that so that's completely foolish and then he fights uh, a whole range um, of, of 16 to 20 soldiers and he won all and, and so that, that is completely impossible he was resurrected he was dead you know you could you could not feel a pulse anymore and the Roman soldiers knew that and so they lay, the people laid him in the grave and the next thing to do was to uh, to make sure that the body was taken care of for, 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 for keeping the body as long as possible and uh, so the, the women went there and the, the women who in unbelief went there because they knew I mean they were um, Jesus had told them that was going to happen um, and so the um, the resurrection took place the stone was rolled away the grave was empty and then you have Jesus presenting himself not just to one person or two people three four twelve one hundred and twenty but at one one specific time he presented himself to five hundred we have all seen and heard that story again and again it it's not hallucination because you can hallucination is a personal thing you can hallucinate but no two people can next to each other hallucinate the same thing that's impossible uh, let alone talking about 500 people that's completely impossible so that that story is totally irrelevant the real real relevant story is that Jesus rose from the dead he was there he was resurrected he went to his disciples and later on he went back to heaven to prove that he was the son of God so Peter believed it he believed this so strongly that he would even die of course the story about Peter being crucified uh, upside down uh, excuse me I mean uh, uh, you, you, uh, you know but you do this you go to the net you google the 12 apostles and you find all types of stories of how they died the most cruel but there is this absolutely no proof except we know that uh, what happened to James we know what happened to Stephen and for the rest well, Steve is not even an apostle, but uh, we do, we don't know. We don't know. So this this stories and and this this uh, this leftovers of those people are, are kept in in the Vatican. I have a word for that. I call that rubbish. The stories are rubbish. It's it's most certainly. It is not true. Peter speaks to us in a very specific way. He is, is voiced and he's, uh, you know, he knows a lot about the Old Testament. He had been to the synagogue many, many, many times before he became a Christian and before he met Jesus. And he heard these stories and the, the reading of the scrolls was done every week uh, and so we don't know whether um, he had full knowledge of everything of course we don't know that but he quotes in his letter here he quotes a very famous uh, sentence or phrase 
Um, and the phrase is from, taken from Leviticus 11, verse 44. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. And that is taken into chapter 1, verse 16 here. So we know the link with the Old Testament. And, and that is not uncommon. I mean, it's very common for the apostles to work with uh, a whole range of Old Testament things, Old Testament uh, words or, or sentences or phrases or things they know from the Old Testament. Let me read you the verse 2 of chapter 1 in First Peter and it says the following, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. This is First Peter. Uh, let's go to, to Second Peter. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. The word precious is important. You will find it all the way through. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Again, knowledge, knowledge, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the Trinity, the Trinity, and both sides. So we have, we have someone who knows exactly what he, what he wants to say, and he knows exactly how to deal with the, the, the problems, and he gives that. You know, the, the, there's a whole range of things he says from the Old Testament we are not going to into because we don't have time to do so. So the second book of Peter, second letter of Peter, of course, and, and, and I, uh, you know, I get angry by people that are still claiming those, those letters are not written by those people. There is absolutely no reason, no internal reason why they should not have been written. And there would be no, I mean, just think about it. If someone else would write a letter like this, do you think the church would accept that? Say, for example, in, in, in the second century, half the second century, uh, half of the second century, yeah, uh, someone would say, oh, I found the letter of Peter. They would say, let's read it. Do you think the church would accept that? Absolutely not. I mean, they are not foolish. They are the, uh, except for a, a small number of people who could read and write, except for the Jewish people, because they could read and write, that's, that's, that makes them exceptional. Many of the Christians also learn to read and write because of the fact that the linkage with the Word of God is so important for them that they had to do so. So you have the third generation the third generation of, you can almost say, smart people, and you bring in a letter claiming from, from, uh, to be from, from Peter, you, you must be kidding. They would have gone through it and said, ha, this is nothing. This, you know, and that's why I believe that those letters that we have today, not only being written, in the first century, but being quoted in the first and in the second century. And you could not just bring in something new and saying this is from one of the apostles. They would not accept that. Don't think about it. So what, what do we have? Of course we have date of writing again before 68 because that is the, uh, the, 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 end, the end possible date. Um, and then you have the purpose. Uh, Peter was alarmed by that false teachers were beginning to infiltrate in the churches. And he called on the Christians to grow and to become strong in their faith, 
so that they could detect and combat the spreading of apostasy. And I, I, that, is, that is even, I mean, it, it looks like written to us today. This is exactly what is happening in church today. That is, people from outside, with or without a degree, they come and they teach things in complete completely against the Bible and people are, are, are soaking it up as if it's really the, uh, the, 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 the truth of the gospel. So wrong. Over-exaggerating uh, grace, for example. That's one of those stupidities. You cannot do If you do that, you, you bring a, a totally different gospel. Or, or, or claiming things uh, like like healings and uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying God is not healing. That's that, that is absolutely not what I'm saying. I'm saying God heals. But look at the Gospels. There are 29 healings, healing miracles. That's three and a half years. 29. Not every not every month. Not even every month. And certainly not every week. And certainly not on a Friday evening when you have a prayer meeting. Excuse me. So, Peter is warning, alarming the church, saying, don't go with it, this is wrong, don't do it. This is apostasy. We have to stress the authenticity of the word of God again and again and again. We cannot build enough on that. A number of key verses, 2 Peter 1 verse 3 and 4, the divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us uh, by his own glory and goodness. Uh, through these he has given us his very great and precious, precious again, promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world causes by evil desires. You know, um, I, I always say that, and, and I will repeat that again and again and again, because I, I cannot say that enough, that is that certain things are completely wrong in church. For, for example, you have a lot of pastors who are filling their own pockets so much that I am ashamed to call me a pastor. Because people know those things. Again and again and again, people are doing things wrong in church. You know what happened again? This week I was reading, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm bleeding inside about the fact, again, one of those leaders misusing his power and raping. This time it was a 16-year-old girl and a 24-year-old. 24 year old. You know, Sunday school teacher. And again, to yesterday uh, in the news, I'm, I'm, I'm so saddened. This is what is happening. This is what is happening. And so we need, we need the people to know, make, live a clean life, live a, a, a holy life. Don't get in, don't give in. Strong, go to the Bible, go in prayer. Another key verse, chapter, uh, verse, uh, 2 Peter 2, uh, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is slow in keeping his promises, as some understood slowness, but he is patient with you, not wanting that anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. 3 verse 18, But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ the Saviour. To him be the glory both now and forever. Again, the word knowledge is being used again and again. Uh, we have to go to, to the next group of, of texts because... We don't we really don't have time. Just look at the the, the books, uh, the letters of John one, two, and three. Um, so, so many things 
are set here and of course when you look at first john one of the one of the the text pops up that is one john one verse nine if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness 1 john 3 6 no one who lives in him keeps on sinning no one who continues to sin has either seen him or know him first john 4 4 your dear children are from god and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world 1 john 5 13 i write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of god so that you may know that you have eternal life i will repeat that again that you may know that you have eternal life again the knowledge is important um, because john's letter was about the basics of faith in christ it helped his readers reflect honestly on their faith and i think that's the, that's still exactly the same thing that happened today we have to go to first john 2 first john 2 to verse 16 and it says the following it's incredibly important because we all know this you know know the verse for everything in the world the lust of the flesh and i talked about the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life comes not from the father but from the world the world and its desires pass away but whoever does the will of god lives forever so in incredibly incredibly important the, the 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 messages you can read in those in those letters are so 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 compelling to us uh, again the uh, the apostle john that's the one who writes one two and three uh john although uh when, when you when you when you look at the text first john starts with <laughs> guess what like john starts uh, that was from the beginning which we have heard so again the beginning that, that I mean that links it up to the gospel of John and links it up here uh, to us so there is a there is a historical reality and John is, is the last surviving eyewitness and he's writing these things down and, and they are written very late uh, most probably uh, end of the 80s and uh, so he is bringing that material to the churches he is in Ephesus at that time he speaks about the grace about the mercy about the love he speaks about the acceptance of God you know like uh, like the statue when you have statues uh, for example in Rio de Janeiro when you have a statue of Jesus with open arms th that is that is how you have to look at Jesus or the man w with open arms waiting for you to come and he will send he will give you grace mercy love and acceptance John is a, as he says, is a witness and he's an eyewitness of what Jesus did and now he's a witness not only uh, of what Jesus did but what Jesus did in his life. So he's, he's testifying saying this is what is happening to me again and again and again and again and so that, that is how you look at it. So he, he's testifying, he's a testifying witness of his personal experiences that God that God became flesh, that's the historical part, uh, to live among man, and that he is uh, giving his grace, love, uh, mercy, acceptance to us, to have an ongoing relationship. So the second book of John, 
uh, again written around the same time. They are seemingly written very close to each other. The purpose of the book is, uh, the book of the second John, is an urgent plea to the readers of John's letter to show their love, uh, the love for God and His Son, obeying by the commandments to love each other and in obedience with the, the scriptures. And it's, it's almost impossible to overstate this necessity for the church today. That is what we need. That is what we need. Second John 2, sorry, Second John 6. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, that's the second time, we have it in first, in the first book, we have it in the second book, the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. Not only God is love, and now we have to show love. Show love to our neighbors, show love to our brothers and sisters. That is what we have to do. Watch out, verses 8 and 9. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may, uh, may be rewarded fully. Remember we talked about the crowns? Rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead does not continue in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So John is um, John is, is, is using the word love, but, but not as an emotion. He is describing that uh, love is not a feeling, but is obedience to the commands of God. And the main command of God, he took from the Old Testament, brought it into the New Testament. That's what Jesus did. And he's repeating it. He says, the first and greatest command in is, love your God. And the second, according to what we have in, in Matthew 22, is love one another. Remember that the greatest enemy of the church is Satan and he's using people to destroy the church and if he would be able he would do so but he is unable because the Holy Spirit God is stronger than the strongest weapon of deceit Satan has in mind has in, in his power the third book of John John again is the author, and it's the same John, it's again the Apostle, although he's not mentioned. You know, that, that's the strange thing here. Some people say the book of Hebrews is not written by, by Paul because it's not mentioned. Well, this is the same thing. Okay, so he, he, he says the elder to my dear friend Ga uh, Gaius, whom I love in the truth, my dear friend. See, that's how he he speaks to uh, to us through the Holy Spirit, guided, and you know. Okay, so we have John being the author again. It is written around the same time. We talked about that before. Uh, the purpose of writing John's purpose of writing the third epistle. There are three things he wants to wants you to know. First, he wants to commend and encourage one of his co-workers, his fellow worker. His name is being uh, named here, uh, Gaius, in his ministry of hospitality, of uh, itinerant messengers who come from place to place and preach. And, and, and that is something we have to learn. When we know someone from outside of the country is coming into, into your place or into your, your village, accept him. Go with it. So the second thing is condemn the behavior of uh, uh, Diotrephus, dictatorial 
leader, and third, the example of Demetrius. And then we have uh, one more book, which is the book of Jude. Jude is the brother of James, and James is the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. Remember, we talked about it. Uh, so uh, Jude is also the brother of, of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, because that's the most he could do. Uh, and then you have the whole range of things, and he's speaking again for example in Jude 3 you have dear friends again see that that is how you you, um, you present yourself to other people dear friends I'm talking to you about the Lord Jesus Christ I was very eager to write you about uh, salvation but I, I I have to talk to you about uh, other things and the other things are they are written for us today. Just listen to it. Look at it. Excuse me a second. They are written to us. False teachers are bringing false doctrines into the church. All types of false doctrines. People say you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do that. Uh, by saying that they are, they are always saying the same thing you have to work for your salvation otherwise you cannot be saved as soon as you work for your salvation you cannot be saved because you don't know you will never know whether you've done enough and that's why grace is given dear friends in verse uh, 17 again remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold you in the last times and this is what we are in those last times 24 25 to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault with great joy the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Speaking about spiritual warfare in, in verses 20 to 21. It is filled, although it's, it's a very small uh, letter, it, it's, it gives you, speaks about uh, the Exodus speaks about Satan's rebellion, of Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses' death, Cain, Belaam, Korak, Enoch, Adam. I mean, it's filled with Old Testament material. And it brings it to you, to me, today. Because we are living in challenging times. Authentic faith always reflects Christ-like behavior. And that's what he wants you to do. The next class we will have is about the book of Revelation. And then we'll wrap up the whole course. May God bless you.